Welcome to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. Jordan Downey is the writer and director of The Headhunter, one of my favorite horror movies of 2018 and now streaming on Shudder. One of the remarkable things about The Headhunter was how resourceful it was. Considering the fact that it was an ultra-low-budget movie, it is extremely ambitious in terms of its scope and world-building, while still portraying a tightly structured and very intimate story about a medieval monster hunter. This is a pretty fascinating balance that Jordan pulled off, and one really worth studying. Everyone says your first movie should not be a period piece, should not have elaborate effects, and certainly should not include horses. Jordan did all three in The Headhunter, and he still kept the budget super duper low and delivered a kick-ass movie in the end. The Headhunter is a serious case study for effective low-budget filmmaking. Even if you've seen it, it's really worth a rewatch for the fun of the movie and for observing its simplicity and elegance in terms of directing and how much Jordan was able to get away with for so little money. This is a really interesting conversation with some killer lessons in low-budget filmmaking. So strap in and enjoy this conversation with Jordan Downey. Jordan Downey, how do you do? Very good. How are you? Good, good. So I, I think one of the most, um, and I know you've talked about this at length, but I think one of the, for me, one of the most intriguing things about The Headhunter was how it was such an intimate view of a larger world. And in a low budget context, I feel like it's difficult to to, to pull that off. It's difficult to do something on a, on a relatively low budget that has a big scale, but a small scope, if that makes sense. And yeah, yeah. it reminded me of something uh, Quentin Tarantino actually talked about. And I'm going to paraphrase the hell out of this, but he was talking about how there's a difference between directors who you feel like you're in good hands with them. In other words, you can they've thought through a ton of things that never even appear on the screen and that never, ever even come up in conversation in the movie's dialogue. But you can just tell that the world is you know thought out and very thoroughly understood. And the audience can sense yeah. that even though you don't necessarily see these things. You know, there's just an overall indication that this world is very thoroughly thought out. And, you know, with your movie, yeah. it felt like such a a small glimpse of a very, very, very large world. And to go back to the Tarantino analogy, I just felt like in such good hands because you just seem to thoroughly have built this world. And uh, I was wondering, how how'd you do that? How? <laughs> Well, thank you. I mean, I guess that stuff could go south pretty quickly, right? And just come across as feeling random. Right. Um, or just sort of like a bunch of stuff that's just kind of shoehorned into something just because it was a cool prop or a cool set piece that you wanted to show off. So for you to say that, hopefully, then that just means that those choices we made of what to show uh, built upon that larger world rather than distracted from the story in any way. Right. Um, which is always the the trick and the key. But to be honest, I have a hard time doing anything other than that kind of world building, just because the movies that I grew up, you know, really obsessing over as a kid, um, typically had that kind of, uh, not, not necessarily campy, but more of that, um, that grand sort of scale, but right. with a sense of, of pulp to it, the way that, you know, Starship Troopers, and Robocop, I love Paul Verhoeven and um, in those kinds of films and then James Cameron and the Terminator and just getting glimpses of the future. Um, and so I, the kind of stuff that I was a huge fan of and that I would collect action figures of and that in, in comics and, and buy the, the, the DVDs and stuff of were always from that massive world yet then coming in as an independent filmmaker with limited resources, obviously you can't go and do that. So right. It's probably just coming from that. I desperately want to do those grander scale scope kind of films but instead i'm having to find a more intimate way in to them hmm. uh, which actually then you know I, I don't know that i don't know that i can take credit by saying like oh that was always the plan right. to make that kind of a film or rather than just kind of that was the hand i was dealt but um i, I in regards to the headhunter like the approach of that world building was pretty early on that we thought it was really cool to see, especially in the medieval genre, mm -hmm. you've got Braveheart and you've got Game of Thrones and even the 13th Warrior. And they're typically that genre for the serious stuff. I mean, there's kind of the more the romance period piece, those movies that come out every year. But the big, the serious stuff is always so massive in scale. It's right. always $200 million. So I think that there was a real opportunity for a lot of these genres, especially like that, 
to narrow it down and focus on a small little sliver of something in that world. Mm -hmm. And that was the stuff that kind of then really started to interest us is that you could play with the idea that audiences already have seen a lot of these movies and they already know about castles and dragons and in, in sort of those staples of sword and sorcery kind of uh, filmmaking and just show little bits and pieces of that, that you would imagine that all that stuff's happening in the backdrop, but you don't have to actually show it all. Right. So I think in our case, like with just the world building, it really just started with the character and it started with his black magic sort of sorcery abilities with that, with the, with the, the goo, the black tar that he uses and how that would resurrect the head that he would then have to face in the end. Once we had that, then we kind of started expanding on that. And by putting like, you know, there's a very quick glimpse of like a hand in a jar or a cage when he's making his, right. his motion and all the weird ingredients. So once we had like the core foundation of what just the plot was and just what the character was going to go through, then we kind of started coming up with all of these different offshoot ideas of how he would collect those ingredients who this archer character being sort of like his only friend. And, you know, even though they make these little things might make a split second of screen time into the movie, Mm -hmm. we've talked about them to the degree that there could be sequels about half of these things. Um, We spent so much time just going down tangents, uh, sometimes productively, other times maybe a waste of time, but tangents uh, of just us basically just geeking out about the different things that this guy would have encountered in his his lifespan. So yeah, I mean, it it just, it's just being a fan of, I guess you ultimately it comes down to, we just became a really big fan of this little world we are creating. And then as a fan, you concoct all kinds of stuff in your head, no different than a kid playing with their action figures and creating a Mm storyline. We just have to end up shooting it and try to put as much in there as possible. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I remember um, hearing when Neil Blomkamp was doing District 9, there were so many other potential subplots that he easily could do movies about. Like there was an entire movie he could have done on the ship and where it came from and what was inside Mm -hmm. and all of that. But just that whole sense of having this big, very well thought out universe. I think he came up with like three or four other potential screenplays that could have taken place Mm -hmm. in this universe and he landed on this one. But again, you can just tell that the work had been done to figure out all those like last little details. Mm -hmm. Did you have any kind of a story Bible to keep track of the rules of the world and these kind of the, the, the alchemy principles and, and all of that stuff? Was there any fundamental Bible? No, no, there really wasn't. Like there was no sort of rule book um, per se, like you say. Um, I mean, we, we had a very, we did, the only thing that bordered on a Bible, I guess, for the film was we had a big visual document that we had just printed out with a ton of reference photos, mostly used for just the interior, the production design, and and, and just aging and decaying and moss techniques and stuff like that because we were, you know, having to be craftsmen as well as filmmakers. But um, there was no kind of Bible for the uh, the rules of the world, no. Um, and And maybe that just came from that we didn't, didn't dive into those things enough that you would ever, that the audience would feel like we were breaking our own rules. Cause mm-hmm. we just never really went down those paths long enough for you to sort of think much more than just, that's just a little glimpse of something, but to not really fully understand, uh, you know, what it's trying to say or do. So we'd love to go back to the beginning, uh, with thanks killing that being your first, yes. uh, your first feature. How did that movie come about? Um, you know, not too, uh, far off from how the headhunter came about ultimately, um, which is just, we wanted to go and make a feature film. Um, you know, I grew up making home movies like many kids do. And I then got to film school and started making shorts there. But the challenge or the, the desire, the dream to make a feature film is, is entirely different than making shorts, not to put shorts down. They have their their time and place and their purpose, but it was just a different, like, you know, undertaking that we were just kind of excited about trying. Um, and then, you know, choosing the, the Thanksgiving themed holiday horror film was that probably just stemmed from, I grew up loving those cheesy, um, horror movies growing up. That's what I would always rent, you know, uh, at the video stores and, 
the, the full moon stuff, the trauma oh, yeah. stuff, just, you know, all of those schlocky, great 80s, 90s VHS covers and all that stuff that gets everyone's attention. I loved all of that. So I think it was sort of like, you know, maybe we didn't consciously say, oh, let's try and make something goofy because we don't feel like we're ready to make something serious. But maybe that was happening subconsciously, that the feeling of making something more ridiculous like Thanksgiving, right. you there's more leeway to screw that up or to <laughs> learn on the fly. Yeah, it was <laughs> and, like your Meet the Feebles. Ex- well, that's exactly. I, I, I was, you know, meet, meet the Feebles, my parents wouldn't let me, they like forbid me to watch it or whatever. So there's probably a part of me that was just like, okay, I got to go do a Meet the Feebles, you know. That's funny the way that um, works, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Thanks Killing, yeah, came about just from us wanting to go and make something. And then Kevin and I put our uh, money together, which was nothing. I mean, the headliner was low budget, but Thanks Killing was another tier below that at like $4,000, 3500 oh, bucks. wow. Tiny. Thanks Killing was four grand. Yeah. Holy well, shit. 30, yeah. 3,500. Wow. 3,500. And then probably because we, in, we didn't have a distribution deal at first once mm-hmm. we finished it. So then we, it actually cost more to print a thousand DVDs and get the packaging materials and and ship those through Amazon right. ourselves. So it was more expensive to print the, them onto DVD than it was to make the movie. Oh my god! And Veritas um, that picked that up, right? Back. Veritas picked up yes, Thanksgiving. Yes, they did. Cool. How did uh-huh. they? In uh, the end, they did. How did they get into the conversation to begin with? We well, so we finished it when we were seniors in college, so we were still in school while we okay. were making it, and then we graduated and didn't have any kind of distribution deal nor any knowledge about how to get one. And then a friend of ours that we went to school with was, I think he was, I don't know if he was working there or if he was an intern at Gravitas. And they were looking, they were just basically a startup at that point. They were mm-hmm. looking for horror films. And we just posted, I think um, Kevin had randomly reached out to uh, our friends with a website link for this website we had made. He passed it on to them. So ran a random connection got us in the door with them. Um, and then they were the ones that released it onto video on demand. And, um, and then from there it got onto Netflix in the very early stages of Netflix. Uh, I vaguely remember and, seeing it there actually. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where it built up its following there. Um, because Netflix in the early days, if you remember, had a lot of that schlocky horror stuff. Like yeah. that was kind of their, it was almost their bread and butter. So I think a lot of people were turning to it for that source of, cheesy entertainment um so yeah it was it was very similar to the headhunter honestly as far as just a very low budget handmade you know work you know with minimal crew and just you know labor of love kind of film just a very different subject matter yeah it felt very trauma inspired was it yeah yeah yeah. it had to have been it was yeah did you watch the um what is it called the lloyd kaufman put out it's like a multiple part (laughs) series uh, i think it's called make your own damn movie and it's just about how people oh it's a book right is it, yeah i think it was a book and then it they did was. like a dvd series or something and everybody's on it eli roth is on it uh, i think peter mm-hmm. jackson shows up actually yeah and it's just Probably. like a bunch of like little little clips of uh of yeah. people talking about how they just grabbed a camera and fucking made their movie exactly that was i remember reading that book yeah uh and yeah, I mean, that was a huge inspiration. Robert Rodriguez's book, um, was it Rebel Without a Cause or Rebel Without a Without Crew? a Crew, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <'Cause the movie. laughs> uh, Rebel Without a Crew. And uh, yeah, those were very inspirational and just and probably one of the best pieces of advice is just pick up a camera and make your own damn movie. It really is when it boils down to it, you know? Yeah. No, I think that that's huge. And I feel like the whole DIY element is something that I, not enough filmmakers think about. Larry Fessenden is a a big proponent Mm -hmm. of that approach. I mean, he just really champions the fact that you, it's, it is a matter of grabbing a camera and actually just, just doing it instead of waiting for the money to come instead of waiting for a green light or waiting for anybody to give you permission. It's a matter of actually, Mm -hmm. you know, doing it yourself. And it seems like the DIY ethos has been a big part of your career thus far. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, I mean it, absolutely, and and like I said, I don't know if it's it's not by choice. I'm not I'm not turning down the big the big things to do the DIY right. thing. It's much more of a, a usually the, they come out of like you know thanks killing came out of just like being frustrated at watching students, including myself, spend a lot of money to make these short films that are going to go nowhere often, right? Or have no chance at making money or doing really much for you. Um, you know, the, the success story of Saul is one in a million or something. Of Saw? Like was Saw student yeah. film? It was, well, it wasn't student film. It was a short film. Okay. But, you know, a short film that turns into a massive franchise right. is very rare. Right. Um, and then everything since the, everything else since then was, yeah, just spawned out of, uh, you know, writing scripts and, 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 and doing the doing the thing in LA and and submitting stuff and then sort of like responding to not even necessarily rejection but just like a lack of response and right then you kind of are just like all right well I'm just gonna go make something then because you need to at the end of the day you you feel like you need to create something or tell a story if that's in you and so it has to come out in some way shape or form now that urge if it's left unfulfilled is mm -hmm. it drives you insane as a creative yeah 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 that drive to create i think it was in real to deal where they talked about how nobody in hollywood will, will ever outright reject you because there's this universal fear that what if i reject you and you turn around and become the next spielberg yeah so like nobody yeah. says no but they just We'll leave calls unanswered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you ever get into like meeting limbo while you were in Hollywood? Like meetings? Uh, at oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was right when I graduated, I thought I was like, this is great. Like, you know, things are working out already. I had won. Uh, there was like this sort of contest type thing that like for graduating seniors um, got to pitch a web series, which mm -hmm. at the time a web series was you know, this new idea. And, uh, and my pitch was for a horror web series, kind of like twilight zone or, or, um, tales from the crypt, but in five minutes, just tiny little short snippets of oh, nice. called red weather. And my pitch was the one, one of the ones that got chosen. And then that kind of kept climbing the, the ladder. And I wrote all these scripts and, and then eventually, yeah, they, like you say, the, the meeting limbo, the development, hell, whatever, you know, like it, you, it, and there's never a good it's never necessarily anybody's fault it's right. not necessarily the creator's fault it's not necessarily the the executives or the studio's fault it's just like unfortunate timing or it just doesn't fit into that perfect little like needle hole of opportunity that they need or whatever right, you know right. circumstance but, but yeah you... plenty of plenty of those over the years of of scripts or meetings or a lunch that goes great and you go home so fired up <laughs> three weeks later you can't get a hold of it <laughs> right just, right uh, well i feel like because of that it is so important to have that diy ethic but also have yeah. the ability to get a movie off the ground yourself i mean mm -hmm. looking at your filmography what do you attribute your ability to get your movies made to i mean is it having a really good dp oh, yeah. is it having like trustworthy you know friends around you i mean how are you able to as a force of nature you know, get these movies done because I feel like a lot of people want to get their movies made, but th there's certain resources that if you have them, they really help in, in getting these movies made, particularly on low budget. So, I mean, what was your, what yeah. would you attribute your ability to, to be DIY to? I mean, for people who want to do make their own movie, what are the, what are the important things to, to keep in mind and to have at hand? Sure. Well, I mean, definitely a partnership is very important. Um, like Kevin, I've mentioned Kevin Stewart that yep. we made, Head on Earth, Thanks Killing, everything. He's the only DP I've ever worked with. Um, and we've written and produced many of these projects together as well. Having that partnership is probably something like I've only come to like appreciate over the years as I have encountered other filmmakers that are trying to do something and get their own low budget project off the ground, but they're going solo. And it's so much harder to not right. sort of like, I, I guess, either bear the failures with somebody else so that you don't feel as alone when you make mistakes or have to just go into these lonely shopping trips to Home Depot to, you know, you're, to sculpt something or build a prop or whatever right. you're doing. Um, so I think that that has a huge impact is having somebody else that has a similar mindset as you. Uh, that can also contribute in ways or maybe sort of be the strength to your weakness kind of thing. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, that would certainly be something if you're, if you're stepping out to try and make something, if there's people that you've come across that are like-minded and that you, you like watching the same things that they're talented, like stay with them, like definitely like keep those, those peers and friends close because that's going to be very important yeah. um, to get stuff made. Uh, and, and I think we've been lucky enough, we've collaborated a ton together and still are, uh, but there's then other friends of ours that, that we've continued to work with as well over the years. So having a core group of friends to help each other is, you know, all the other little technical skills are secondary to the people skills of the support system, I guess. Yeah. And I've talked to multiple other director producer teams who they do all of their movies together and they say they just, they can't speak highly higher enough of the importance of having some sort of a partnership. I mean, not only to share the production burden, but to just share the burden of the difficulty of getting movies made. If it's, if you're by yourself, it is way, it's like having a gym buddy, right? Like if you have a buddy you go to the gym with, (laughs) you're going to go to the gym more often because you don't want to let him down versus if you're trying to make movies by yourself, you're way easy, way more likely to, to, to give up, you know, and it is the kind of career path that is loaded with so many trials and tribulations that a lot of people do give up, but having other people to help you weather that kind of existential storm seems like it's, you know, a huge heads up. Or a huge leg up. Absolutely, to weather the storm together and then also to both be very proactive in how you are still learning and developing in your maybe your own specialties so that as you both take those steps forward, someone is offering something new each project. And you're, right. And then that's how you get growth and that's how your projects, you know, continue because you're, you're, you're challenging each other. It's a push-pull yeah. in a good way. Yeah. And it seems like it's also important to have a peer group around you immediately of other people who are making movies, not necessarily people you're collaborating with, but other people mm-hmm. who are making movies. So you can turn to them either for advice or, Hey, can you read my script? And you know, like mm-hmm. that seems like right. it's just, you have to surround yourself with people on similar missions, so to speak. Yes. Yes. So how did you meet Kevin, by the way? It was, did you guys go to college together or? Yeah, we went to college together. Okay, we were both it. at film school at Loyola Marymount. And we, uh, we were just some of the few people that, you know, every weekend there's student films going on because there's a graduate program, a master's program as well. So there's the grad students who tended to be older Mm -hmm. uh, in their twenties or late twenties or thirties and had a little bit more experience. So you tended to grab it. Those were the bigger and better sets. Right. And Kevin and I were just some of the few people that he worked in the camera department. I worked in the lighting and grip department and we both just worked our asses off. I mean, every weekend we were just on another student film doing all kinds of stuff, production design, makeup effects for me, nice. um, camera assistant, uh, stuff for Kevin mostly and, and back and forth. And so we just kind of, we were some of the few people that were always there and awake at two in the morning on a set and just naturally became friends, probably based around our work ethic and then also just being fans of, of horror and science fiction as well. Cool. Cool. Um, so going back to headhunter, I mean, obviously when you have a comparatively low budget, I mean, we talked about where the world building element was there in terms of your preparation process for doing headhunter, were there any particular movies that you watched either low budget movies that could show you how resourceful you could be with, with lower budgets, um, or any, any other movies for inspiration? Yeah, yeah, there was a bunch. I mean, we watched certainly like The Witch stood out because as mm-hmm. far as just, you know, surface level period piece horror. Right. That had not been done uh, for a while or it, it really hadn't been done in the way that they pulled it off. Just as far as like those sort of fire and torch lit kind of scenes and isolation in the woods and that kind of stuff. So I think that was probably like maybe something that we saw that we were like, okay, this is a good sort of like reference point for just how you could approach that, that, that genre element jammed into a different time period and setting can work. Right. Um, And then quest for fire uh, was a big one because of just the silent nature Mm -hmm. and just the traversing across landscapes concept. Um, And again, fire, natural lighting, natural landscapes, and just, you know, the, the, the using the, Earth's cinematography, if you will, yeah. to sort of like help. 
There's really something to that. I mean, the witch looked so beautiful, and it was all shot in natural light. I mean, it looked amazing. I, I feel exactly. like Hagazusa took a cue from that as well. Um, but yeah, the, yeah I um, saw the witch with the commentary on. You hear Robert Eggers talking about the 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 things that they did to get that movie made. I mean, the the, the level of detail that he put into that is is pretty insane in terms of making it fit the time period. They didn't get. They were trying. They were looking all over the world to get the right goat that was indigenous to the specific area that this was supposed to have taken place in. They didn't end up getting the goat, but they got a goat that actually looked sort of like it, so it worked. But that was his level of attention to detail was uh, was insane, and it wasn't like he couldn't afford the lights. He just preferred the look of you know all of that natural mm-hmm. light. But it's a beautiful look for a movie, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and scarier because totally. you start to really feel. Um, if done well, you really feel like you're there with them or that if it is only, you know, you're only lit by that single source, whatever mm-hmm. it may be. Um, it feels much more realistic. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have those big, you know, moon shafts that horror films are guilty of all the time. And, <laughs> um, you know, avoiding that kind of stuff right. is a key. So, um, yeah, those two were uh, those two were key. Uh, I mean, we did basically go back and watch a ton of medieval stuff. Like I, I remember seeing the Thirteenth Warrior when I was a kid, so we went back and revisited that, and just things that were in Game of Thrones. We were deep in that as fans at the time too, um, and they're very risky with their cinematography and just some of the look of their mm-hmm. their worlds and that bleak black sort of look. Um, those were reference points. Um, Story wise, though, like I got a lot more like mo- the things I'm mentioning now are more reference tended to be more references for just the the production design, costume, cinematography kind mm-hmm. of um, skill sets rather than like story wise. Story wise, I was much more interested in the feeling that I would get from things like Tales from the Crypt or Twilight Zone. Yeah. That had this sort of like really or like even Creep Show, those little shorts there's that great one where there's like a black sludge out on the water oh, yeah. that the, the kids are trying to avoid. And I always felt like those things were like, those episodes always had this like riskier nature. Like they were just like sort of filmmakers that were like uh, wanting to run wild on this crazy idea, but everyone was too scared to make it as a standalone film. So they <laughs> right. would oh, well, let's just make it as an episode of this crazy idea. Yeah. But they all and could have worked they, as standalone films as features for sure. Right. Right, they could have exactly, but they didn't always perfectly follow the 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 you know the filmic three act structure that right. hits the exact beats that feels very, I guess, kind of predictable in a movie way that you sometimes want to try and hit but avoid at the same time. And so I I was much more interested in that, like this weird empty mood that you could get, almost kind of like something like Stalker or just a Tarkovsky kind mm. of movie, and like Solaris. Um, was a big reference too. So I was more interested in the mood and the atmosphere. But then those medieval movies, if we looked at those for just strictly like some of the look and, and of the costumes and everything, then I thought, okay, cool, we could have something pretty special if the mood is almost from one one side of the spectrum and then the look is from another. And together, it might create something really unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they were very, it was very harmonious, you know, which I feel like it's so easy for a movie like that to go off the rails because you have very elaborate costumes and the guy's sort of like a Viking kind of character. But not for a second, does does anything feel cheesy? I feel like that's such a difficult balance to strike. Was there any... Do you have any idea how you were able to pull it off? I mean, one thing for I mean, me that really is like the kiss of death for for low budget movies um, that feel mm-hmm. low budget is when uh, when the costumes are pristine and they're not lived in, you know, and they're not yeah, worn yeah. in. That oh, it's just like it, it to I it totally ruins characters. I think, and it really just lets your budget show. But I mean, the, the you, Headhunter feels so seamless. How um, I forgot my original question. What was I saying? How. Um, how did we not let it get cheesy or yeah. how did it keep on low budget? It looked believable. And yeah. yeah was I it mean, a measure of like intuition or, I mean, what was your probably? Yeah. I, I mean, I, it would have to be just because like I was, you, I was the one doing the dirt makeup on Chris every day yeah. um, because there was no makeup. I did the prosthetic stuff. And so, you know, and we, we basically touched every prop in there. So it had to come from just us knowing like you said, I totally agree that usually a, a giveaway of low budget stuff is a lot of times bad cinematography and mm-hmm. 
in very harsh lighting with ridiculous colored gels and just unnatural kind of approach to show yeah. how you shoot a movie and the lens choices and where to place the camera and all that. But um, then a lot of it would just be the costume and props. So we really did spend a lot of time making sure stuff was appropriately aged. And if something didn't look right, that we would sort of like block it out, blur it out, put a little foreground element in front of it and really try to like show off the stuff that did look good and be and pick and choose the kind of props we were showing. Right. Um, but yeah, it was definitely nerve wracking. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't ever really too worried that like our prop choices would, or that the prop like elements would look, would take you out of the movie because you would see plastic or right. something. For instance. I was more worried if anything that, I kind of tend to really like when movies have a little, they're, they're okay to like have a little bit of fun. It's not like entirely a dreadful experience. Um, and you know, but not necessarily in this case, full Sam Raimi or Peter Jackson, right. but I love those guys. And so I was always kind of drawn to trying to find, to like bridge that gap between Sam Raimi and something like Robert Eggers of the That's witch. Cool. And, and that's where probably just the head and its voice and like the squirming and some of those kind of elements come from that. I just like that pulpier horror. Yeah. I loved that touch. Pulpy is the perfect way to put it because it just yeah. felt like good old classic kind of like eerie and creepy novels in a medieval yeah. setting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. 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 Without, but pulpy can become cheesy very quick and, or, or you know, like such a fine line. <laughs> It absolutely is. And there was bits that we cut out on. And I think like, luckily, Kevin and Ricky, who produced it, Ricky was, is not necessarily drawn to that pulpy kind of stuff. So having being surrounded by other people that probably were like, hey, like, you know, you, you we shouldn't show as much of this hand or this prop is looking a little questionable here. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I, I, I love that stuff. And I love the idea that I felt like you could actually go a little further with it in the medieval setting. Like there's these crazy like snap zooms. Like he walks up to the sack on the ground and it like it zooms into the sack. And then there's a reverse on him that zooms up into his face. And there's this ridiculous musical sting. Mm -hmm. And it's so almost 70s horror film or like some Brian De, Brian De Palma kind of like sting. And it's like so ludicrous but i thought well you know i think we could actually get away with some of these strong horror tropes because they've never been used in this setting before so we're te we need to remind people through some extreme gestures that you're watching a horror film in the the kingdom of game of thrones or something that's um, interesting yeah because there was a lot of things it, that it felt familiar it could have what yeah i was just saying that could have that could have gone into cheesy territory so i'm glad it it, it didn't somehow yeah it's such a fine line in between something that is kind of exploit exploitation-ish and pulpy and camp and and for me it's are yeah. the actors taking it seriously or is the filmmaker taking it seriously? Yeah. i feel like when you play everything straight you can largely avoid that kind of camp trap which is uh which is definitely a good thing mm -hmm. for sure yeah yeah so the movie was 30 grand is that right there yes 30 to make the movie and then um I think all in all, maybe it ended up being like 40, 45 once, once that, you know, you had like just legal fees for just dealing with the, um, the distribution deal and yeah. getting the, the, the LLC set up and just, you know, business accounting stuff. But yeah, the movie, what you see on screen was about 30. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, in retrospect, are there any kind of hacks for saving money or anything that you observe a lot of indie filmmakers overspend on? Um, I mean, I don't, you know, most of the indie filmmakers that I, you know, know closely enough to know, like, how they're going about their business is mostly just friends. And we've kind of all collaborated on different things together. Um but no, I mean, the hacks were one, just do as wear as many hats as humanly possible are yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, that's step one is that you just, you cannot afford to hire a, a bunch of people. Like you can afford to hire a few specialists. Um, and yes, they are being paid way less than what they deserve in exchange for a back end, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, a deferred pay. Um, so, I mean, yeah, like you really just have to kind of 
do as many jobs and be, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty, literally, uh, yourself. And also, like, we didn't know how to make corpses and, and Halloween props look, you know, remotely authentic. We just went on Google and YouTube and, and read books and just studied and, and obsessed over, um, you know, Instagram accounts of people that do it and just taught ourselves that stuff and learned it. Like, there's the information is out there yeah. uh, for the making if you are willing to put in the time to to learn everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, to keep things that small, obviously a small cast because, you know, at some point you just can't not pay a bunch of people. And even if, if, even if everyone is working for free, it's just still more mouths to feed. It's, it's travel accommodations. It's uh, another hotel room, another flight, another right. rental car, whatever you have to incur. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was... It was able to be that small because the props and everything were very cheap. A lot of stuff was found in that village, um, just old antiques that we resor- that we sourced. And we never really, there was never that one big expense that we had. It was just very much a group of people out in the woods making stuff happen with the little, you know, that they had. Nice. Yeah, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of... Um... A lot of indie films, lucky indie filmmakers, will find a crew that will work with them f- not and, and not necessarily get paid what they deserve, either for a deferred mm-hmm. payment plan or something like that. And I feel like it's a, it's a rare director who can actually motivate people to do that, to kind of create this sense of mission where they do want to, they want to be there. Um, and they, mm-hmm. they're happy to, they're happy to, you know, be on board for the sake of the ride and for the sake of the project. So was there, how were, it sounds like you, you, you were able to do that to a certain degree with certain crew members, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like Andre, for instance, who built the costume, he had been building a lot of amazing, amazing, uh, and the costume is fantastic. I mean, it's the poster. It, it is the mo- one of the most important things aside from just Chris, right. Um, in the costume, but, um, Andre had been building all kinds of costumes for LARPing, for just kind of like sale on Etsy and just kind of like to, uh, you know, leather uh, sort of costume collectors. Mm -hmm. But he's never done a movie. He always wanted to do a movie. And so once we when we found his work and we and he's based out of Sweden and then wrote him, um, he was just very excited to be a a part of a movie. So a lot of times you can find Mm that there are very skilled people who are working in different uh, professions that you might need for your film. If it, in this case, costume design in other cases, maybe it's the effects or editing, but you have to give a lot of people their first chance. That's definitely something that's more useful for an independent film. Mm. If you're going to go try and get the big special effects specialist who is just coming off of the, you know, a, a huge film but you're offering them no peanuts, like that's probably not going to work out. You need to go and find the person who just hasn't been given the chance um, and, and relate in the same way that you're going out to make this movie because maybe you haven't been given the chance to, to do the bigger thing or whatever. And so you're all kind of in it together. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily have some big motivational speech or email that I'm, I'm sending to people. <laughs> I would hope that if if they are coming on board um, from or seeing some sense of leadership is just coming from that, you know, how hard we work to make their stuff look good. And, and I think that's where it comes from is I just think you work your ass off. You work really, really hard, do the best work. Don't put anything out there um, that you aren't proud of and that you don't think is the best. And Mm -hmm. people will follow that and they'll, they'll want to contribute, you know, to that. Um, it's not about sitting someone down and giving them the big pitch. You know, right. <laughs> well, I feel like there's something enormous to the notion of finding other first timers as you're mm-hmm. doing an indie film. Um, and create and is, and there's something almost karmic about that. You know I mean? The idea that you, you turn to like a clothing designer who never worked on a movie before and you gave him his first costume designing gig and he probably, you know, 
really, really came to bat for you because of that. I mean, I, I think that there's a, there's a huge element to that. Instead of turning to a you know costume designer who's done dozens of films and yours might not be their priority and you're fighting with every dollar you have versus somebody who's really going to dive headfirst into it because they're so excited that you're working on a movie. I mean, I feel like a lot of filmmakers forget how cool it is that they're making a movie in the first place and that if they turn mm -hmm. to the right collaborators just through virtue of their passion, they can get... Um, and get some incredible, incredible collaborators out of that. So that's, that's enormous. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and of course, you know, being honest is super important because that could be taken a very wrong way in terms of that could be seen as you're taking advantage of young people or people right. who for first timers or whatever that who don't understand unions or the Hollywood system or just like what what rates and what oh well I can't do that and it's overtime and meal penalties and like and all that kind of stuff you're it's not about taking advantage of someone who's ignorant to those of course. sort of dealings it's about um being honest and upfront and that's how we've always been of just like look this is what it's going to be like this is what we have if the movie does well you'll benefit in that too um but yeah finding people that that are just passionate mm -hmm. is and, and, and keeping that uh, core group as small as possible is key. Yeah. Well, that being said, I mean, obviously with Headhunter, you were in a, re a remote location. You were probably very much at the mercy of the elements. Were there any really difficult time periods where, um, where it was a struggle to keep morale up on set? And if so, <laughs> was there any, any keys to keeping morale high during difficult, the difficult circumstances that often come with indie filmmaking? Yeah, there were some tough times for sure. I mean, just, you know, we talked a lot about just the natural lighting and stuff, but then there's times where just the sun is, you you don't have the tools to, to diffuse or block it out. And so you're just like, you're waiting around or, or I think Kevin felt probably stressed a lot at just like having to shoot stuff that he wasn't fully comfortable with because there was no way to control what the sun was doing. Yeah. Um, I think that the worst part you know, morale wise was shooting in that cave for the climax of the movie. Um, because one, it was probably came like three weeks in to the movie and it's sort of this feeling of like, man, like we, we've gone, we've come so far, but we haven't actually shot the ending to the movie yet. Mm. And there's just this feeling of like, you've got this big, you, your, your energy is kind of spent yet you still have to shoot this part that you consider to be very important to this working or not. And that cave was so claustrophobic. You're going in single file and oh, you, the torch is putting off fumes um, because there's no ventilation in there. It's a real cave. It was cold. I, I caught some kind of a weird little freak, like 24 hour cold of some kind and just had to like take a day off and sleep. Um, so I would say that was probably like the, the hardest um little stretch there was maybe a week period there like around week three to week four and then after you get over the hump then then you're feeling better again mm -hmm. um but there were a lot of really difficult difficult things i learned a lot about being a director that had nothing to do with what ended up on screen um but that had more to do with like making difficult decisions and facing those sort of like the elements telling you, no, you're not going to get to make this, the scene the way you want it to be. Um, the horse stuff was difficult mm -hmm. and we had much more stuff planned with Chris riding the horse, but it was raining that day and the horse couldn't run, couldn't oh, get up to full speed galloping in the mud. It was unsafe. And so just kind of like ultimately just like making those snap judgments of, of actor safety and crew safety and all that kind of stuff over getting those moments and having absolutely zero uh, answer for how that's going to be fixed in the edit besides just saying, let's sleep on it and we'll figure it out uh, the next day or figure it out down the line. So there wasn't like, I mean, as far as like the, you know, getting over those tough times, I think you have to just be able to take a breath of fresh air. Don't take it out on anybody else. Certainly. Um, it's not the way to do it. And and just kind of step away and, and give yourself a moment to, to think mm -hmm. um, and to refocus that night and to realize that ultimately there's always an answer. There's always a solution for all this stuff. There's always a workaround or a way that you can cut something in 
And I don't mean just a cheesy voiceover, or a flashback. Like those are the like the the nightmare things of fixing a cut. But there's so many other ways that you can do it creatively. So to not get too upset about any one thing, um, and then to do something fun. Like I remember our last night. Like Chris was. We still needed to shoot. Um, it was our last night shooting with Chris, and we still needed to shoot a couple of shots of him kind of with the torch in full costume going through the woods and and chasing the head down to a water well and off into a path and whatnot. And it was like, you know, 9, 10 p.m. And I was just like, guys, let's just go back, eat a nice meal, open some, open a couple bottles of wine and just sit and, and relax on Chris's last night. And then I'll put on the costume the next day with this wig and beard. We had oh. a fake wig, fake beard. I'll put it on and we'll do it the next day and stuff. So kind of just also knowing when you can slide responsibilities to yourself or, or elsewhere so that everybody can relax and celebrate as a whole at the right mm -hmm. time. <clears throat> uh, but it, it's hard. It, it's just, you know, in the end of the day, it's you're, you're working with friends and just human interaction and just being able to read, read when people have had enough and knowing when to like take the foot off the gas is important. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, one thing that you, you struck that I feel like is, uh, is so important for directors to, to realize is that the notion of being on set and compromising without compromising. In other words, when you realize that the shot that you had and very elaborately planned out in your head, isn't going to work, how mm -hmm. do you find a way to get the shot without necessarily compromising on quality mm -hmm. or without saying, no, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Or just, you know, breaking under the pressure, you know, directing is way more than, than just, having the ability to get movies made on a, on a technical or even emotional level. It's dealing with these problems, but still mm -hmm. create finding creative solutions. And it sounds like this largely was mm -hmm. a, uh, was, it was a masterclass in doing that. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, uh, you never, I guess you never know, right? Like what the alternative would have been to a different decision. You don't get to see that movie. I don't know what that movie would be, right. but you do your best and you try to just, you know, stay, uh, it's it's hard to definitely sort of stay to remind yourself of why you're doing this and to be able to tech, take that like existential step back to just say like look we're right on path like this movie's coming out great and look at all this footage and this is why we're doing this and this little piece here doesn't does not is not worth getting in the way of of uh, you know of of either friendship or just generally of mistreating of other people right um you need a macro uh, view at all times exactly as much as you can yeah you've got to got to go macro and micro you know back and forth constantly mm -hmm. um yeah so looking at the movie in its finished form what would you have spent more on and what would you have spent less on i don't necessarily mean money it could be time mm -hmm. energy resources or money but what would you have spent more on and what would you have spent less on um would have spent more on the final climactic fight with the monster. That was always like, even though the intent was to keep as much monster stuff off screen for the first two thirds of the movie, that once we got to our main monster, we wanted to show as much as, as we could while still keeping it terrifying and everything. So right. I would love to have been able to see, I mean, originally we had a very, detailed sort of idea of like how that final skirmish with with our hero versus the the resurrected dog monster on his daughter's body how that was going to work and we wanted to really and visually show that like he is having to do combat with his daughter right and that this thing can run and it's fast and it's relentless and it's grabbing knives out of his sheaves and stabbing stabbing at him and just like it is coming at him very very um violently and then the cave ended up working out great because it's an awesome location but there was just so much limitation with just the props and you know at the end of the day these are just plastic bones and and this is these are not sophisticated puppets or props at all it's a hand puppet and plastic bones that chris is a lot of times bringing to life with his own shaking while we have a fishing line or something <laughs> dowel rod off screen so practical very, effects very, very very rudimentary practical effects um so i would have i'd love to have spent either more time and money on 
showing, making those practical effects come to life, even if it was just an extra two or three shots that really sold um, that that head kind of floating on top of this body with this yeah. long neck spinal cord. So we made some really cool concept art and did some tests that showed what we wanted it to look like. And just then once you start to, you know, put it in motion, just impossible for a tiny crew. Yeah. Um, I mean, there were other, like probably what I would have, you know, it's a, it's a specific thing, I guess, but spending less time, um, I would have spent a lot less time on this one shot we were trying to get where the final shot of the movie basically the second to last shot of the movie when the monster who's got his body is standing it walks up into the doorway and it turns back and it says body mine we went through all kinds of different originally that thing was going to turn around in broad daylight show off the practical effect show its face it was going to talk and everything we were going to show it just here you go you waited the whole movie here it is and we just couldn't figure it out. Like it just was not looking right. Either we put it onto like we built like this ridiculous C stand rig with like a green screen, um, green screen on my arm, so that we could remove my arm digitally and let the spinal cord show through, and oh, then man. it could like puppeteer the head. And we spent hours and hours. I think probably almost we spent half a day wasted on just trying to get this rig and this effect to look right, and it never did. And then in the end, it ended up being like these, we put the costume up on my shoulders, like a shoulder pad, football player kind of shoulder pad rig. And then and I was controlling it like kind of like a puppeteer. Um, so that was a specific example of like, we definitely went down a couple of rabbit holes trying to figure out a couple of specific effects. And I wish that I would have just resorted to the easier thing that mm -hmm. ended up looking good enough. But instead of trying to like get too impressive uh, with any one gag and right. spent more of that time getting more, um, you know, the movie is filled with a lot of those moments where he just like pees, he pisses out the black tar, kind of like passing a kidney stone kind of thing. And I would have loved to have had more of those little moments of just showing the pain on, on little character bits like that, rather than, you know, wasting six to eight hours on, yeah, Some ridiculous effect that looked horrible. <laughs> I feel like every indie movie's got that one shot, that <laughs> one scene that you Probably. obsess over. For <laughs> Probably, yeah, I'm sure. So, on your um, directorial journey, were there any books or resources that were particularly helpful for you, either from a creative perspective or from a uh, from a business perspective, when it comes to filmmaking and directing? Um. Trying to think of anything not related to Headhunter that's been very helpful. Books. We talked about Rebel like, Without a uh, Crew. Rebel Without a Crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make your exactly. own damn movie. Those, those two books, of course. Like you know, I probably found those in high school, um, and read those. Um, I don't know. I mean, I there was a lot of probably there there wasn't any specific books i can say that i read i know there's a great stephen king one about um writing oh, that yeah. i am wanting to read it's a good one i've not actually read that you can actually listen to it as well it's really good oh, on nice. audible and it's him talking so the first really? half of it or not the first half the first like couple of chapters he goes into like a lot of semi laborious detail about his nanny and his teachers and his this and you it it does add up to something but you have to, there's a little to get through, <laughs> but it okay. is such a golden book and it's fun to listen to for sure. It's like, you feel like you're just sitting around, you know, having beers with Stephen King, but okay. uh, it's great. It's great advice for not just writers, but creatives of all stripes. It is about the creative process and our own kind of internal mechanisms that, uh, that make us shoot ourselves in the foot, so to speak. But it's, yeah, it's right. great. It's a great, it's okay. totally recommended read, but it's also great to listen to as well. Okay. I will, I, I will get on that. Yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I read like Sid Field's book on screenplay structure in high school. And like, you know, once I started to take, you know, just the idea of movie making as a profession more seriously, mm -hmm. but those kinds of like technical or in the blink of an eye, the Walter Murch editing book, I read that. And there's a bunch of different technical ones. There was one on directing that I had to read in school. I'm trying to remember. Um, what that one was, but I ended up gravitating a lot more towards just audio commentaries or interviews with filmmakers to hear 
less in like a structured blueprint kind of way, but right. just more of like a human telling me like how they came to those decisions uh, and why, and just how smart some of these people would sound, you know, to me growing up and in film school and still to this day that you just feel like, wow, you'll never be as, you'll never be as well-spoken as some of these filmmakers <laughs> or whatever. But um, yeah, a lot of audio commentaries behind the scenes, featurettes uh, and, and, and interviews with yeah. filmmaker. Yeah. I grew um, up in the DVD era yeah. and those, those behind the seat, the scenes comment, the behind the scenes featurettes. I just devoured those like crazy fight club had one of oh, the yeah. best I've ever seen and just so much good stuff. In oh, I've era. never seen that. Okay. Oh no. Yeah. It's oh. uh, there's a lot of great making of stuff. And if there's a couple commentaries as well, yeah, it's a good one. It's definitely a good okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, and then recent times podcasts for sure. I mean, you know, things like your show and, 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 uh, I'm a big fan of Mick Garris and, yeah. uh, postmortem podcast and, um, and, and movie crypt with Adam green and Joe Lynch and yeah, they're so the, much fun DGA podcast and all kinds of stuff. So I, I don't, I love, um, just soaking up as much as that is possible, but there's not that one thing that's my go-to Bible as far as like, this is what, you know, flipped a switch for me or anything right. like that. All right. Yeah. Speaking of Mick Harris, uh, when we were talking about movies like Creep Show and Tales from the Crypt, did you see Nightmare Cinema? No, I haven't. Oh, I have a shutter description, so I have no reason not to. But I, I know it's a, it's an anthology, right? Like yeah, two or it's three. Excellent. Parts. And it's it's okay. very much in the same vein where you see each one and you think this could be a standalone feature easily. But the fact that they're so condensed, they're just so they're super duper. They're just all bursting with the seams. It was uh, I actually got to see it in a theater. I saw it at the Overlook Film Festival, and it was such a fun night at the movies. It was uh, okay, cool. it's a yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, and it's very much in the tradition of Creep Show and stuff like that. Yeah, really okay, great stuff. Nice. There. So what do you uh, what are you up to next? Writing a lot of stuff right now. You yeah. Know? Um, we, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Like the, the nice thing about the headhunter is it has opened up a lot of doors. And in those days of, of maybe sending something in and being lost in the shuffle um, are not as common uh, as far as just people taking things seriously mm -hmm. because of how much success the headhunter had and just what we were able to pull off and, um, and turn it into so, but a lot of writing and trying to figure out what that next. I've written a bunch of stuff since then, and um, and and have a few things that are kind of making the rounds and in the development process and cool. starting a new script in the next week or two and sent another a new one out two weeks ago and all kinds of stuff. So You're mostly staying in the horror genre, horror adjacent. I love. I love science fiction too. I love, yes. I mean, horror or, or horror adjacent cool. for sure. I mean, I, I love the, the, the track records of Sam Raimi and Peter Jackson. I just watched the, um, for love of the game the other day and I love, and I love simple plan. And so I've always loved the idea of getting in and of eventually I, I definitely want to do dramas and, and thrillers and action films and all kinds of stuff. Um, but yeah, for right now, there's a lot of stuff that's in the horror horror realm but not quite like headhunter uh you know not like period piece necessarily or yeah or that kind of straight horror um i'm always drawn to something that's got a little a little weirdness in it or just something unique about it um yeah you know it's you just regardless of like what the the exact offshoot of horror is you just kind of know an idea like it just strikes a chord with you and when it does then you just for me i live with them for a while and maybe even years or months and, and you start to outline, you start to build upon it. And eventually you just know it's time to, to write that. And then, um, I think the thing I've found and that I'm, you know, trying to take my own advice on still is just that you should always be having something in your back pocket that you could go and do for yourself, something small, have a project idea, a script, that's smaller. And then also, you know, try to win the lottery with another one and, mm -hmm. and write something bigger no, I'm not saying write the $200 million thing, but just write something bigger that you need the studio financing for, that you want a theatrical release for, whatever the goal is. Um, so I'm always alternating between both, you know, make a small movie like Head Enter in between. There's a bunch of bigger stuff I'm trying to get going. And then meanwhile, I'm working on the smaller stuff on the side that if those don't go, then I've got uh, the other thing that I'm just as excited about that I'll turn to. Yeah. 
No, I feel like that's golden advice to have multiple irons in the fire that are in different scales, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Last question. Now with all this uh, quarantine downtime, have you discover any recent movie discoveries or anything awesome that you're binging? Um, I mean, the shows that I've watched recently are an outsider on HBO. Love that. Watchmen, the series, love that. Been meaning to watch Watchmen. It's great. Um, And I just finished Devs the other night, um, which started out, immediately hooked me. Then kind of was like, okay, where's this going? Got a little slower. And then the final few episodes made it worth it. For I haven't me. even heard of that. What is Devs? Devs. Uh, well, Alex is Alex Garland's show. He did Ex Machina and Annihilation. Oh, shit. Okay. Mini series with Nick Offerman. You might have seen yep. he's kind of long hair and a beard in the show. He plays a serious actor or he plays a serious character. Um, Devs is awesome. If you liked Annihilation and Ex Machina, that I kind did. of heady, existential, dread sci fi, yeah, you'll love Devs. Okay. Um, and Ozark, um, I just started on season two of that. Oh, season um, two. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, so, uh, I, I've finished season two. I've like two episodes deep in season three. People are saying season three is the best season of them all. A lot of people are saying yeah, they're just good. blown away by it. So, yeah, you got a lot to look forward to. Okay uh yeah a lot of tv and then you know i i have been just going back and watching i'm trying to think of what uh movies i've watched recently that i that really stood out to me that i really liked i know there was something that that i saw that i'm totally blanking on right now i don't know maybe it'll come to me but in in addition to that too like just trying to learn other things like i've i'm just i used to draw a lot in high school so just drawing i just I have an iPad Pro coming today, actually, just so that I can get back to drawing and storyboard. I've always been kind of storyboarding and sketching cool. concept art and things. And so um, just getting back to to some of that kind of stuff. And Kevin has been getting uh, really into un- learning Unreal Engine and designing virtual sets and, and everything that they're doing for The Mandalorian is fascinating. So uh, I've kind of been dabbling a little bit in that kind of stuff. Um, just the basics of, of learning, you know, new software and stuff. And mm-hmm. so just, yeah, going down a bunch of different, you know, rabbit holes and then seeing how those things, ultimately I try not to get too, uh, obsessive about any one thing unless I feel like, okay, this can really help me pitch ideas. Cause it's, it's easy to get off the beaten path from just the goal of, of writing and directing projects that you're passionate about. Yeah. So if it doesn't, if it doesn't, help you with that and it's not just a pure hobby then it's kind of like it's good to understand it from the basics but maybe not you don't need to become professional on a lot of these different skills yeah i feel like with filmmaking having a kind of being a jack of all trades and master of none enables you to see the connections between all of those things so that you you I, i think all of that does make you a better director yeah yeah at least under exactly understanding what every department has to go through is never a bad thing yeah yeah cool well jordan thank you again this was a real blast any parting wisdom or advice for those aspiring filmmakers out there i mean no i look it's it's this the old thing that you always read and maybe it gets to be annoying that you always see this but it really is just like you've got to just pick up a camera and start doing your thing um you really do it you're not going to and finish it too you know like an unfinished film does no good the way an unfinished script does no good just finish it give it your all like go full blast with the score and the sound design everything put it on youtube like market as much as you can do whatever you can because the only way you really will learn is by going through the complete process like Mm. yeah you could just start to shoot something or just you know start to write something but if your goal is to direct a movie You've got to go through the complete process, finding distribution, all of that stuff, you know. And and I think that finding a way to make a feature, you don't want to do too many of these, because right, because then you could get kind of just pigeonholed into doing that. Those the low. If you made ten thanks killings, then yeah. you're the guy that just makes ten thanks killings. So, but if you're setting out to make your first feature, find something tiny and doable, and just make it a feature. Don't settle for it being a short or anything else, you know. So that's the best way to learn. Um, so yeah, you know, really it is just one day at a time and, and get going. <laughs> Great. Wise words. Thank you again. This was awesome. You're welcome, Nick. Thank you so much. And, 
and uh, and take care. I'll, hopefully, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, man, for sure. All right, a lot of big lessons from this conversation. Here, as always, are some key takeaways from this conversation with Jordan Downey. Number one, think big scale, small scope. There's a real balancing act to simultaneously building an ambitious and fantastical world while maintaining a tight focus. But it can really be a magical combination when it's done right. Jordan created such a vast world of medieval warriors, monsters, and complex systems of alchemy. But the story was so elegantly simple. For a low-budget movie, the world building was extremely ambitious, and it worked beautifully because the largely single character focus was so tight and so stripped down. On a lot of low-budget movies, directors sometimes try to go too big with their world building, and they end up in that no-man's land of campiness. This is not where you want to be. One of the ways that Jordan was able to pull this off was by thoroughly defining the world his characters lived in, well beyond what was in the script and on the screen. It may seem unnecessary to do all of this development for things that never show up on the screen, but their presence and existence is still known and realized by the viewer. By developing your world that your characters live in, and even by overdeveloping it and creating story bibles and rules and laws for things that you never even see and that the audience never sees, you're able to create a world that lives and breathes beyond the seams of the movie. And the audience can always tell. It's like a funny subconscious thing, but it's absolutely true. And multiple directors have talked about this. With a low budget, high concept, your high concept needs to work. And you do this by developing it and understanding everything you possibly can about the world your characters inhabit. Freaks and the Endless also do a great job of executing a highly ambitious amount of world building on a very tight budget. And that is not Todd Browning's freaks. Number two, there really is no excuse Four grand. That is what Jordan's first movie thanks killing cost. And it was a feature. The movie was picked up by a very reputable distribution company called Veritas Ventures. You've probably heard of them. And this paved the way for his next movie. So a recurring theme I've seen in speaking to a lot of directors is that you're never really supposed to have enough money to do anything. You're not supposed to have a smooth production Ever. The job of directing is to overcome every single conceivable challenge and obstacle and make the movie despite your circumstances, not because of them. Four grand. Easily acquired with credit card debt. Even though, I don't know if I want to advise doing that, but... It's doable. As Jordan and many directors before him have said, it really is a matter of just doing it. Number three, give people their first chance. On The Headhunter, Jordan got a killer costume designer who was able to deliver way above the budget of the movie, substantially boosting the believability of this world and therefore the overall production value. The interesting thing was that this costume designer had never done a movie before, but had perfected his craft by creating costumes for cosplayers and LARPing, which sounds really dirty, but it stands for live action role playing. This guy was so exceptionally talented and was stoked by the opportunity to finally do a movie. So he was not only affordable, but he completely over delivered. Finding these creative win wins that leverage the opportunity to work on your movie can really bump up your production value substantially. In the throes of pre production, it's so easy to lose sight of the fact that making a movie is pretty fucking cool. And there are so many talented people who are dying to work in film. Don't feel the need to be limited to people with experience. Finding talented newcomers can bring you some fresh approaches and a ton of energy. They'll deliver and appreciate the opportunity, and their passion can move mountains on your movie. Now, it probably goes without saying that it's never okay to exploit people. So if you can't afford to pay people what they're worth at the time of production, always make it up to them and make it worth their while, either with deferred pay or by giving them a piece of the movie. Anyway, guys, thank you as always for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, why not share it with your friends and family on social media? Don't forget to follow the show on Instagram at I'm Nick Taylor. That's I am Nick Taylor. And on Twitter at the same handle. Thanks again for listening to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. 